Very nice to see you all here. It's, uh, it's funny to see always how the wind is blowing in such a room like this, right? So it's apparently from that side because everyone's got stuck there on the chair. Uh, but uh, no, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, and I'm glad we also have a bit of space yet for people that are a bit later still coming in. Uh, my name is Don Ginsel. For uh, some of you I haven't seen just yet, uh, and uh, uh, CEO of Holland Fintech currently. And uh, we're organizing a lot of uh, activities like these meetups, always focused on connect, learn, and innovate, as we say, uh, to actually create a large network of players that are active in fintech, financial innovation, digital finance, whatever you want to call it. Uh, learn uh, from each other where you know industry is working on and where you might be heading, as well as to actually, in the end, come together and act on it and to innovate. Uh, and today, we're very happy to actually have a special uh, edition of this meetup hosted by ING. Uh, as you all have figured out by now, uh, but uh, we're co focusing on ESG, uh, one of the hot topics of uh, of this year, where uh, partly due to new regulations, right? So I think uh, financial institutions have been forced to currently start reporting on uh, their ESG the impact on environmental, social, and governmental issues uh, of their activities. But at the same time, you see a very big drive within society to actually look differently at what you do, uh, and sort of everyone's being now transformed into. Uh, at least having a social cause that you're actually aiming for, not just because society wants it, but you also see, for example, that younger generations of staff is actually looking for that kind of purpose to work towards, rather than just to make money and uh, you know have a big house. Uh, so in the midst of this trend, and I think this is really interesting to see uh, that development, we're going to explore to in depth what that's about, uh, and looking forward to have an interactive discussion with you. So um, I'll just briefly pop up the agenda. So you have a bit of an idea what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, and of course, we're trying to make the, the sessions as much interactive as possible. But of course, at the end, we'll have some time to, to drink. But not too long, because of course, afterwards, around 8 o'clock, I think most of you would want to be behind a television screen or something to check out uh, how it's going to go with Argentina this afternoon, right? Uh <laughs> all right. Um, no, so looking forward to that, uh, but let's first, uh, uh, Simon, a bit from you. Uh, very uh, thankful for, of course, being hosted here by ING, and uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing a little bit about you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, welcome to ING, first and foremost, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to have all of you here today. Um, my name is Simon Boonen. I'm a fintech lead and fintech consultant at ING, or ING NEO specifically, our innovation uh, department. Um, we decided, as a long-standing member of Holland Fintech, to, uh, to be here and to host uh, this, this meetup for today on a topic that is uh, dear and close to also uh, our company's heart, ESG. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to an exciting afternoon. Uh, great presenters, great speakers. Uh, we'll start with a market update by Don. Uh, then uh, we'll give the word uh, to Leon Wijnans, our uh, COE Innovation or ESG lead for ING Netherlands, uh, who's uh, got a very appealing story for you. Uh, we'll have a panel afterwards in which we will also build upon Leon's story. And then finally, I'm looking forward to have some exciting fintech pitches towards the end of the program. And then last but not least, obviously, uh, a great opportunity to do a bit of networking. Uh, so as said, uh, really looking forward to the program. Uh, I hope uh, it will be engaging, interactive, and meaningful to you. And uh, definitely also looking forward to, to connect uh, at the networking drinks afterwards. Thank you. Back to you, Don. Thank you, Simon. And uh, let's keep in detail. And for, for hosting us here, I think we're really happy to, to be able to uh, work with, uh, with ING in such a place. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, great that also, indeed, let's say, larger organizations like ING are really pushing as well for this I, uh, ESG transformation. Um, so we've, uh, if you have been more to our, uh, to our meetups every second Friday of the month, we always do a bit of a standard program where we do a market update, we do some pitches, and we have a Kahoot quiz with, uh, to challenge you a little bit about what, we, uh, what we're going to do. Unfortunately, today we don't have the Kahoot quiz, uh, but we do have a brief market update, which is just to give you some insights about general things that were happening in fintech over the past month. Uh, and uh, so please, if you, if you were looking forward to the Kahoot quiz, save it for January. We're going to do a very big one uh, at that moment, I'll promise you. Um, to, uh, oh, this is just a brief, briefly just about Holland Fintech, uh, why we're all doing this, right? So we think it's really valuable to actually have knowledge and network as a shared resource to help everyone move forward. Our vision is that the financial industry is just expanding from a couple of hundreds of players to tens of thousands of players that are all somehow interconnected. Uh, and to be able to find those connections and understand where their potential lies, that's where we think you could actually really benefit from coming together and sharing to with each other what you're working on, what you're looking for, and to find that collaboration. Um, we work with the whole industry from that perspective, so whether you're a startup or you're an incumbent player, whether you're deep in tech or whether you're more service-oriented, 
it actually really doesn't matter that much because we're very often actually not talking about tech, but actually much more about how the financial value chain is getting shaped in different forms than we were used to. And, and technology is a, is a trigger for that. Uh, just like, for example, blockchain is a trigger to let us think about a way of rethinking, a distributed way of doing finance rather than doing it centralized. But actually, it's in the end not really about technology. It's much more about how do we want to collaborate as people and organizations in such a value chain. Um, so this gives a bit of an insight on how that works, right? So it's basically all stakeholders together, one place, connect, learn, innovate. I think that kind of says all. Um, so that said, what happened last uh, last uh, last month? Uh, we every Friday we make a. Um, a summary of the uh, basically the news that happened in the last week, and we try to give you uh, at least sort of very easily in your mailbox an overview of the latest news, last funding rounds, last opinion pieces from uh, leaders in finance, as well as uh, uh, some interesting research reports that might give you some data on how specific parts of the market are evolving. For uh, this part, we basically looked at just the funding side. Um, Interesting to see that in any case, uh, uh, let's say there's a big wave of layoffs going through the industry. We've seen already Klarna, Stripe and others already doing big layoffs, uh, which has much to do with the fact that valuations have gone down in the past year. Uh, has much to do with rising interest rates and inflation, which means that people need to bring their income forward. So a lot of companies are really banking on growth. We're basically saying, you know, we'll make a profit in 10 years from now. Now we're just going to burn money to grow as fast as we can and hire a lot of staff in marketing and sales to do that. Uh, but now all the VCs, also driven by their LPs, are saying, let's bring that money forward because we're actually not sure we can give you funding next year. So you better be able to keep up your own pants. Uh, and to be able to do that, you need to lay off staff because you need to become profitable. Uh, and so also over the last month, we see that and actually I think still this week as well, we saw an, again another group of layoffs. Uh, I'm not sure which company it was this week, but again, they just keep on coming where tech firms have to lay off staff. Um, interesting other development was uh, with Instagram. Um, we know of course that Meta or Facebook as it was known, was already experimenting a lot with NFTs. Uh, they were of course thinking about uh, setting up Libra as a payment means on their network, which was highly scrutinized and at some point cancelled, uh, or at least got under the radar. Uh, now you see actually that one of their other firms, Instagram, is now uh, exploring a uh, marketplace for digital collections. So they keep on exploring, I think, in this uh, crypto space uh, what to do. I think quite interesting to see what, uh, what will follow as uh, Instagram is, of course, really transforming from a picture channel to a complete marketplace where actually it's not about the images anymore. The images are great marketing for stuff that's being sold uh, and that's actually what the platform is about. So it's basically the future of commerce to a certain extent that's taking place. And I think that's interesting to see how NFTs or non-fungible tokens uh, are actually going to take a place in that. Um, by the way, interesting for you to know, a non-fungible token, what's actually the difference with a fungible token is, for example, a euro is fungible because it's actually not identifiable, right? Every euro is equal. While actually, if it has a serial number which is unique and is un not changeable, that makes it non-fungible, basically. So that's the only difference between, for example, a regular Bitcoin and a non-fungible token. That's sort of what you could look at. Um, all right, we see that basically uh, climate risks are behind the agenda of the ECB. I think uh, uh, it was an interesting report that was published last month. Uh, I would definitely uh, encourage you to check it out. But you see that in general, there's a lot of warnings still going on, uh, especially around the, the COP27 uh, conference that was going on in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, where you saw that actually leaders in uh, across the world were not really able to make impact on, uh, on the climate agenda, except for the fact, of course, that uh, they were able to set up a fund for developing nations to support them in recovery of potential climate uh, disasters, uh, which I think is a big achievement, but I think a lot of uh, uh, environmental institutions were hoping for more to actually get uh, uh, also more uh, higher ambition on the reduction of uh, carbon dioxide, for example. Um, well, UK is very much focused on cybersecurity, actually making quite a big step in actually making every, di every device registered. Quite an interesting challenge as well, I think. Uh, and I'm curious whether the rest of Europe is going to follow that uh, that lead. Um, uh, JP Morgan is uh, doing a transaction on, def on, on the decentralized finance uh, transaction. So decentralized finance, <coughs> which basically is blockchain-based or crypto-based financing, where you can actually try to disintermediate and let 
investors and uh, parties that are being financed coming together directly in one marketplace. Uh, and of course, it's always really interesting that it actually aims to di disrupt the traditional industry and basically avoid use of traditional banks. But of course, you'll see that many banks are actually very interested in this concept and are actually making big investments to explore this space themselves to play a role in that. And that's also why this, I think, this is interesting news to follow uh, from that perspective. Um, the same is actually happening as well on the uh, digital asset uh, settlement platform that uh, a couple of other big banks are setting up. Uh, quite an interesting one as well, uh, where the you know the uh, also JP Morgan again and Goldman Sachs are actually co collaborating on creating a settlement platform to avoid uh, existing markets and create a new place where you could actually do settlements. And I think that's always the interesting part is that so in the end, blockchain allows for a lot of new ways of setting the these kind of solutions. At the same time, very often regulatory, it's really hard to accomplish this because from a, from a legal perspective, a lot is not possible. Uh, but still, we get a lot of inspiration from trying to use these tech-driven uh, perspectives as well. Uh, and at some point, they will get more impact, I think, in the market. Um, Let's see, uh, open banking has hit New, uh, New Zealand, always uh, very interesting. I think we saw already that uh, Australia was quite uh, quite active there, and now you see that actually being spread all over. Uh, I'm also in talk with uh, parties in the Caribbean that are actually, for example, also exploring that in the, the uh, um, uh, someone from Aruba actually recent recently spoke that's working on that. Um, uh, so in the end, everyone is working on that, and at the same time, Europe is already working on the next level one, so new regulation coming up there in the coming year. Good to keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Um, uh, privacy coins, uh, which are the so-called mixers, right, that actually help you uh, basically make uh, crypto uh, unidentifiable. They're m quite likely to be forbidden in the EU uh, uh, quite soon, is in the case the EU is uh, contemplating that. We had a big fraud in is Estonia. I'm not sure if you read about that, but that's an uh, interesting one where there was, again, a big fraud with crypto, just like we saw uh, uh, also with, of course, FTX. Uh, uh, quite a shame that we see a lot of frauds in that space. Very often also you could actually attribute to it that there's a bit of a, a dual um, approach to that from a regulatory perspective, right? We see that regulators actually don't want to regulate crypto because they don't want to endorse it. And at the same time, because they do that, uh, they also can't prevent certain uh, collateral uh, damages from happening. Uh, at the same time, I think it's always, it's, it's basically the, the fact that the market is so liquid and global and can take place outside the regular jurisdictions makes it really hard to, to, to get your hands on. Um, at the same time, usually much of the fraud that's being done is what we've actually seen in all industries where you potentially could actually, uh, you know, fiddle around with the bookkeeping. Uh, it usually goes wrong uh, if there's no good supervision. Uh, but really a shame. And so also in Estonia, also uh, we saw a big, uh, big scheme like that. Um, and another interesting one, I think is the last one here, is the, the Gaia-X program where uh, the ECB is tapping in. So Gaia-X is uh, actually an AI program run by the EU, uh, which is quite important and is sort of is uh, on the global stage. It's supposed to make sure that Europe is keeping up with what China and the USA are actually investing in, in uh, artificial intelligence to stay at, uh, at the top level uh, of the technology making available for all of us. Uh, and it's interesting to see, to see in any case that also the ECB is there uh, interested and in making a move there. Um, just checking in with all of you there, is this, was this good to follow? Were there any terms that were unfamiliar or anyone has a question about? Sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to actually understand that you're actually using a lot of jargon while doing this, right? So I'm trying always to stay away, but um, in any case, always feel free to ask because I think in general, it's not normal that everything is, uh, is, uh, uh, is normal. Um, then we'll just look at a bit of uh, funding over the past uh, month. Um, uh, quite some serious rounds actually, while in uh, October, it was a bit qui more quiet. We saw that uh, uh, SE Ventures uh, got a big fund up. Um, uh, that's a good one. Uh, Balance raised uh, uh, 300 million, uh, quite a si significant amount. Wise, formerly known as TransferWise, uh, got a serious amount in as well with an undisclosed valuation, which tend to mean that they uh, did don't want to talk about it. Um, uh, a lot of uh, companies now actually have to do a down round or at least a round that is less shows less growth than they were used to until last year, so that's why people are a bit more careful there. Um, Built Award uh, raised some serious money uh, in Switzerland, uh, and Novo uh, as well, uh, a, a new neobank uh, from New York. 
quite interesting to see the neobanks are still uh, doing quite well, although it becomes harder to fund them because they're actually typically the parties that need a lot of money to acquire their customers. So they're the ones that actually can make money in the real long run when they have a lot of customers, makes it <coughs> which is a bit less fit for the current funding environment where everyone wants you to make money fast. Uh, which so you actually see a balance shift from B2C to B2B currently. Um, No, Silicon Valley Bank is actually a bank uh, from Silicon Valley, weirdly enough. Uh, no, so and they actually have a, a target group, mostly startups and scale-up, that they aim to fund. They operate as a regular bank, uh, which has a bit of a venture arm, but is most of the time actually does just uh, lending and everything else we're, we're known from banks. Uh, but they're not so active in Europe. They have one branch office in, uh, in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, we've been talking to them as well to see if they could actually... Ah, okay, 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 no, sorry. So they do have a branch office in the UK as well. Uh, in mainland Europe, only in Berlin. Uh, and I think they're basically looking after providing debt to startups and scale-ups like uh, normal banks would do, but then especially more in the riskier segment. Yeah? Okay, thanks for asking. Um, then we had in the um, uh, in the Dutch market, we had a couple of funding rounds that are also just worthwhile to mention. Uh, Florijn, uh, one of our members that actually uh, does uh, debt financing, or sorry, uh, invoice financing for, uh, for, c for SMEs, uh, raised uh, 65 million for their, for their fund. Uh, we Travel, a uh, platform that actually does not just do the booking, but actually also the payment of travels, uh, raised uh, 27 million. And Share Council, a uh, organization that does, uh, that allows every employee to own a share in the company they work for. Uh, very nice uh, concept as well, where sort of shared ownership of companies becomes much more a thing. Uh, they recently uh, did that through crowdfunding. They raised one million. Um, I'd like to wrap it up with that. Uh, any questions or anything that anyone picked up and says like, hey, why aren't you talking about this? Because we can't tell everything. So there might definitely be something there that you actually have heard and said like, hey, wait a minute, what happened there? No, are we all good? Then I think it's time to talk ESG. Um, Leon, are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah? Ready. Yeah, indeed. So I'll let me give you a clicker. Uh, let's give a big hand for Leon. Looking forward to, uh, to hear from you. I, yeah, now it is. So thank you. So. Um, yeah, first a little bit um, about myself. Um, working in, in, in the sustainability space for quite a long time already, but also stepped out of it for three years. Um, and that was over the past three years when I was in, in private banking. That's why I wear this shirt with, with pride. It's only company pride, but there's also a very small private banking on it. It's a golf. Uh, people who play golf will know the brand. I don't play golf, by the way. I hate golf. I hate people who play golf. So I was not uh, very uh, well <laughs> positioned to do, to do private, uh, private banking, as you can uh, imagine. Um, but after three years making rich people richer, I, it, I found out it was a little bit too far away from my personal purpose. And when I got the opportunity to, to step back into the sustainability space, I, I gladly uh, took it. And now I'm heading um, a transformation program in, in, in the Netherlands. And um, talking about private banking, which is about rich people and poor people. What do you think rich people and poor people have in common? They want to make more money. They want to be happy. They live, that's definitely true. No arguing about that. They both have stress. And why do they have stress? <laughs> we, we, we rehearsal this. Eh? Why do they have stress? Losing the money can then be stressful. Not having the money can be stressful. Right. So there is a research in the US that uh, millionaires, until 5 Euro million euros, these are the poor millionaires, 75% um, of them has stress on a daily basis that they make the wrong decisions about their money. And it's a kind of a bell curve that people who are on the uh, outsides of the bell curve, even the, the chemical processes in their brain are almost 
similar. So making ends meet has the same stress as I can lose my money. So that's what they have in common. Now the question is, what's the difference between rich people and poor people apart from money? What's the difference? Health? Health? Is uh, health. Health is the difference. Yeah? Any other suggestions? What's the difference? They have the means to combat the stress, yeah? Any other ideas? The answer I was looking for, sorry? Inclu that's really true, yeah? The answer I was really looking for is share. Poor people share everything they have. The poorest countries in the world, they house the most refugees. Uganda, one of the poorest countries in the world, is the biggest country when it comes to housing refugees, richest countries hardly uh, take their fair share because they have so many concerns uh, and issues to solve uh, themselves. And you don't only see that on a, no worries ladies, it will, uh, I, will, I will not go further than uh, only <laughs> this, but this is the end of the private banking show. Uh, you don't only see that on a, uh, country level, you also see that on, on a individual level. I, I personally, I, I already told you I was heading the global uh, Department of Sustainability, so I was at these climate conferences in Paris and in Poland, I was uh, with all these rich people uh, flying in with helicopters in Davos on the World Economic uh, Forum, where billionaires talk to billionaires about the problems of poor people. Uh, I was uh, in, in New York and in Beijing talking about uh, climate change, but one of the trips that I found was the most life-changing was a trip I took to Nepal. And we had there the opportunity to visit a few projects that we were supporting as ING. And everywhere we came, we were received in this way. People sharing everything. Everyone, anyone ever been to Nepal? Anyone ever had that po chai? Do you like it? You do? Oh, the next time we go together, you can drink mine. So po chai is, is tea with yak butter in it. And they don't call it yak butter for nothing. It's really yucky. At least I think it's yak. Uh, and, but d d you are the one who gets it because that butter, that's, that's really uh, important for them to, to get all their uh, energy in it. They d even don't take it themselves. They give everything they have to their visitors. And uh, this was one, hotel, one of the hotels that we stayed uh, in. It was a uh, one-star hotel, as you can uh, see. We were driving around with these UN uh, uh, vehicles. And uh, this was one of the schools that we visited, an Islamic school. Uh, so these girls, they were really happy with the books they got. But as you can see, there was, there was even no furniture, no desks, uh, uh, nothing. And then here at ING, we are uh, complaining about our thuiswerkplek, hey, oh, oh, oh. Uh, how do you call it in English, a Thuiswerk Black? Your home working, home working, off home office, yeah. So, um, and then we went to Kathmandu. <coughs> and in Kathmandu, we were visiting a project of Dance for Life. And I do have pictures, but I will not show them for the sake of privacy of those girls. But the Dance for Life project was a project which, will had, to, which had a purpose to help young girls uh, who had a history, because I'm talking about girls between 14 and 18 years old, who had a history in the sex industry. And perhaps I need to repeat this one more time. I'm talking about girls between 14 and 18 years old who had a history in the sex industry. And my daughter, she was 16 years at that time, and we were having conversations with each other about her future. And these girls, which had the same age, they needed to come clean with their past. And this project was led by Dance for Life. And they gave us the opportunity to experience how, how they did it. So we were in this very dark room. There was only light coming in from a corner. The, the, the daylight was a kind of a basement kind of uh, area. There were 14 girls uh, there and we were with the three of us. 
And the first exercise, we were sitting here, girls were standing over there. I think it was a three, four meter uh, distance. We all had to close our eyes. Girls had to close our eyes. And then the facilitator, she mentioned body parts, and the girls had to touch that body part. So hair, forehead, eyes, nose, belly, belly button, breasts. And although it was a three meter distance, it really felt too close. It, it felt too intimate. It, it felt as if we did not belong there. And then we came to the second exercise, and that was about dancing. So the facilitator, she took her smartphone, they she put it on the desk, turned some music on, and that was also why it was a Dance for Life project, so the girls started dancing, and then, of course, they invited us to do the dancing uh, as well, so we were dancing, and for some kind of reason, despite the fact that we were closer to each other, it felt not as intimate as being at that distance because we were joining what they were doing. And when we were dancing, we said, it's a bit awkward, huh? this, this music through an iPhone, although it's a reasonable speaker. We know what these girls need. We need to buy them a proper Bluetooth speaker. Uh, that's so that we can also do something uh, concretely that the next time they do this exercise, they have proper sound with a proper bass, uh, so we, we thought it was a great idea that after the session we would go to uh, a shop, buy a, a Bluetooth speaker and, and, and return. And we were pretty excited about, about this idea. Because ultimately, that is what people want. People want to participate. They don't want to stand and observe, but they want to participate and, and join. And they want to contribute to something. That's what people really want. And that's also what we wanted. And let me take you now from Nepal, highest, one of the highest places in the world, also one of the poorest places uh, in the world, all the way here to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam. A country where 60%, close to 60%, uh, is in the danger zone for flooding. A country that where if we put our dikes behind each other, uh, we come from here to New Zealand, because that's necessary to keep that water out. It's not for nothing that the government really takes climate change really serious. It's self-interest. I personally, I live in Almere, very close by, three meters below sea level. Those of you flying in uh, from Schiphol, they will have passed that crossover. And AP 2.8 or 3.7, what is it? Anyone, any idea what that means for the foreigners? It means that you're just landed on an airport almost three meters below sea level. So it sounded a great idea by then. By now, it becomes pretty strange. So, we need to change. We need to change our, the way we live. Uh, no more gas for all our houses in 2050. Uh, but also for our companies, businesses, they need to also to, 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 to move to, to more sustainable uh, investments. And that means that not only companies need to change, households need to change, but also financing needs to change. Because all this financing needs to be done. And the Netherlands is also a country where the social infrastructure is pretty weak. A lot of Dutch people are financially unhealthy. Four out of five employees, they have, em or employers have employees with financial problems. Uh, but also we have a lot of households with problematic debt and even a lot of people below what we call poverty level. One million households in the Netherlands are below poverty level, one million. And that number is increasing. <coughs> uh, and so people are worried. They are worried about the effects of climate change, but they're also about the worried about the costs of climate change. What will this climate policy cost us? Um, it's not responding very well. And uh, we also have inequalities issues. So the big challenge that we have is how can we create a transition in which people, we know what to do, sorry, we know what we need to do, but the big challenge is how are we going to do it? Because what needs to be done is quite clear. The how is the problem. And how are we going to, to create a transition in which everyone can participate, but also everyone can 
contribute because we already established that is something what people want. In other words, an inclusive transition. A, a transition in which we leave things better than found, but also a transition in which we leave no one behind. And our answer to that within ING is sustainable progress for all. And that's why we work on two big building blocks. The one is financial health, and the other one is planetary health. Because, and there is a clear overlap, because you could say that energy poverty is somewhere in the middle. People who are struggling to make their ends meet, they're not thinking about doing investments on solar panels or insulation in their houses. There are two short-term focus. So you cannot solve the climate change part for the whole country if you don't solve the first problem as well. They are co completely interlinked uh, with each other. And then we need to see as ING, we need to look and focus on, on, on where the impact is. And I will skip this for the sake of uh, time because I already see some nervous uh, faces uh, in front of me of the timekeeper. Uh, I want to really switch now to the role or the possible role of fintech. Um, so what are, what are areas that fintech can do in order to leave things better than found, but also leave no one behind? And I have three examples for you. The first one is on awareness. So how can we create more awareness with especially consumers, but also with small businesses and businesses? Because the why is pretty much clear, but people struggle with the what and with the how. And an example uh, that we now are working with is GoGo. It's a, uh, I don't know whether it's FinTech, but at least it's tech. Uh, and it's a uh, UK uh, company which provides us with uh, emission factor data so we can show in our app the footprint of consumers uh, based on their daily spend. Because 20% of your footprint is in housing, so you can change that with the energy label. 7% of your footprint is in travel but 70% is in buying stuff, or rather not buying stuff or buying different stuff. And creating more awareness around that, that hopefully triggers also behavioral change. The second one is on insights. So how can we provide people with more insights? An example where we work with is Plinker. And Plinker is a hub which uh, helps us uh, getting people out of uh, financial uh, stress situations when they are uh, uh, when they're having budget coaches uh, and it links budget coaching to your personal administration and, and it also links online to offline so it's not a online only uh, application but it's an application where the municipality has uh, access to where the client has access to but also where the financial coach has uh, access to in order to get people out of uh, problematic debt. And last but not least is about solutions. Uh, because we very often think that the problem is financial, so the solution needs to be financial. And then we develop a green mortgage or a green loan or a sustainability improvement loan. And all these products, they do the same thing. They give some kind of a discount for financing. But the loan is never green in itself. It's not the loan which is green, because it's all the same money. It's the asset that we're financing, or the people that we're financing, or the business that we're financing, that makes it different. And that is where the change needs to happen in the first place. We cannot finance something which is not happening in a real economy. That's impossible. So creating that awareness is an example on how we, for instance, partner with HomeQGo. And HomeQGo provides a technical solution for people struggling with, how I, I want to do improve the effic efficiency label of my house, but how do I do it? Where do I need to go? And they make a 3D print of the house. They come up with, is it insulation? Is it solar panels? Is it a heat pump? Uh, is it changing your uh, uh, windows? They use actual prices, but they also link you to government subsidies that you can get. They link you to actual installers who help you with uh, the execution, and they can link you to the bank for the financing part. So covering the whole ecosystem instead of trying to sell a green mortgage and hope that something will change uh, moving forward. Back to Nepal. Back to those girls. Because it was a third exercise. So we did the, the body part, we did the dancing, 
So the third exercise was about asking questions. They got the opportunity to ask us all kinds of questions. And because we did the dancing, uh, there was quite a lower threshold to ask us anything uh, they wanted. So they wanted to know how many kids we had, uh, how we were going to the office. Oh yeah, they also wanted all of us to sing our national anthem. So this evening I'm prepared. Huh? Uh, that's also uh, uh, what they uh, uh, wanted. Well, all kind of uh, questions. Was it was really a, a cool atmosphere, a and we were about to leave, um, and uh, still excited about our idea of going to buy that Bluetooth uh, speaker. So we were close to standing up, and then a girl in the corner, one of the youngest girls, she said, uh, "Can I also ask a question?" So we said, yeah, of course. So we back to sitting again on the floor. And she said, what's going to happen next? And I said, what, what, what do you mean next? What's going to happen after this program? And that was for me really difficult to answer because we were not the, the owner of the program. I said, what, what do you mean after this program? Well, we, we learned everything about uh, sexual transferable uh, uh, diseases and, and how to avoid it and, and why, why uh, we should do something different. But we did not learn how to go to a new job. You did not learn me how to become a taxi driver or a, a, a sewer or, or anything else. And that means that probably when this program ends after six months, I will return to what I did, hopefully do it in a more safe way, but for the rest, nothing has changed. And there's something, if there's something that that girl has taught me, is that the solution is not always the technical solution. It's not about buying a new Bluetooth speaker. Because these girls, they, they, that girl was not in need of a speaker. All she wanted was a future. And that is why it is so important to leave better than found, and to leave no one behind. That's what I tried to put in your brains over the past 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Very, uh, very uh, appealing, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Mic, please. Yeah. Um, so uh, indeed, a very inspiring story, I think. Uh, and I think it's a great, I think we need stories like these to actually uh, fur basically further explore the transition that we're in the midst of. Uh, and see what ways we could all contribute to actually uh, uh, make that work. So, uh, so thank you for sharing. I think uh, really, really valuable uh, food for thought. Um, <coughs> now we actually want to explore a bit on the some of the themes that were taught. So please come forward to Menno. Then uh, we can take it from there. I think we're. Let me just click on the next. Uh, my uh, panel members already. Yeah, I'll uh, leave you to introduce seats. the panel. So yeah. let's uh, let's give our panelists a big hand, uh, everyone. Uh, Menno. Thank you. <laughs> panelists, please take a seat. Uh, Sandra. Marcel, Iris, yeah, sit there. Marcel in the middle, so we have a great uh, diversity picture. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for uh, for having me. Uh, Simon uh, asked me to uh, to uh, to to be part of this uh, panel and maybe also moderate it. I, I think yeah, that's uh, that's challenging. I can ask questions to myself, but luckily we have uh, we have uh, found a really great uh, great panel. Uh, deep diving into uh, into sub sustainability with you. Um, I'm an advisor to companies on innovation and sustainability. And actually, Don, it was about eight years ago. We were just close by uh, with the first uh, fintech meetup. Uh, I was working for ABN Emro by then on the innovation side, um, uh, and now fully focused on advising. Uh, other companies, such as uh, insurance company, ICT companies, but also helping uh, Holland FinTech on um, how to uh, improve the startup, uh, the startup ecosystem, and especially on, uh, on this topic, uh, ESG, sustainability. And I found it's, uh, it's got a lot to do with, uh, with letters. So uh, Leon, thank you about uh, showcasing the letters. So we will try to cut a little bit through this uh, letter uh, uh, jargon and really uh, talk about sustainability. Uh, and I think Leon already expressed uh, strongly the urgency, uh, both on a, on a global perspective and here in the Netherlands. Uh, and I just want to ask you a question. So uh, raise your hand if uh, you don't want to do anything good to all these purposes. Please raise your hand. 
you don't want to do any good. Huh? What happens if you raise your hand? Yeah, right, that <laughs> then you will get a question and run for the mic. <laughs> Um, no, okay, so it's the end of the year, so uh, you might already be thinking about new resolutions you have for, for the next year, or you maybe you're thinking back in the beginning of, uh, of this year, did you make any resolutions? So who made um, a, a resolution in the beginning of this year about maybe sustainability and improvement in your life? Who you for, can you Can you raise your hand who did that? Yeah? Thank John. You raise your hand. Did you did you met those resolutions? All? Yes and no. Yes and no. Partly. Did you met them? A bit. Well, if it comes to sustainability, and that will be the central question uh, of uh, of our panel, uh, it is even worse. So we have a lot of intentions, but really getting into action and really delivering—that is the hard part. Um, so I'm curious about my uh, my fellow uh, panelists to deep dive in this uh, uh, on this question. So how to take action on uh, sustainability? Um, and uh, I will introduce you one by one for uh, for warming up. Um, uh, I have uh, a, a question uh, on a personal level for you. So what's your personal why? Why you're working on uh, on sustainability or why it's part of uh, of your life? Um, and Iris, um, if I may start uh, start with you. So um, you're a professor uh, of company law, working for the University of uh, Leiden, but also uh, um, a partner of uh, Ace Management Consulting. Um, so we have some really really smart uh, some smart people here on the panel. Um, please explain your your personal why, and maybe just for the audi audience, lecture us a little bit on what is ESG. These three letters. What do they mean for for us, for companies? Yes. So first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, well, my personal why, um, I think I'm just a passenger uh, on this planet. And uh, the I think the, the letters you actually uh, uh, just mentioned uh, are a, a part of my purpose. Uh, and I try to contribute with the qualities I have, uh, which is partly educating the new and the next generation, I think. Uh, and in my personal life, I try to be as sustainable as I uh, as I can. Okay, yeah. thank you. And, and ESG? Yes, so and the three ESG. The three magic so it's, uh, it's, it was already a little bit mentioned. We have this alphabet soup of letters sometimes. And ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. So this term was actually coined uh, by uh, the Global Compact, which was actually an initiative of 20 financial institutions in 2004, which was about the report Who Cares Wins, uh, connecting the financial markets uh, to a changing world. So already in 2004, we were working on sustainability. So the E stands for environmental, which deals with climate, air, biodiversity, land, so all the issues uh, that we have there. And the S stands for social, which means um, uh, your own workforce, workforce in your value chain, affected community, it's the social pillar of uh, sustainability. And then governance, which is very much in the scope of my expertise, corporate governance, it's about the structure of your organization, but also the processes and the business conduct that you, uh, uh, well, you have in your uh, organization. Uh, and sustainability is about uh, getting it right in all those different uh, pillars. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. For was that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's deep dive uh, into uh, to the E, the S, and the G uh, later on. Uh, also with you, um, uh, and then we have Marcel uh, van der Kuil. Uh, your uh, expertise background is uh, technology and uh, and data working for uh, for a lot of uh, uh, banks, nearly all banks, uh, you said. So uh, curious to hear from you, of course, your personal why, why you're putting this background uh, knowledge into sustainability. Um, and maybe also explain in the in a similar way uh, to the audience about one of your topics, the EU taxonomy. Already so, so no letters, but again, a complex word. Can you, uh, can you uh, help us out on this? Try to make a good joke. But uh, this got me started because of a severe accident I had in 2004. So I'm a quantitative person. So, uh, you know, because of my study and my background, but that changed my life, gave me a second chance. 
uh, then I decided to spend a part of my time, which is available to me, on the spaceship they call planet Earth. You know, we're all supposed to be astronauts, right? Uh, so dedicate a part of my time to research science and innovation and try to educate people that need it the most. Uh, so that's been very uh, fulfilling ever since. But then it brought me to in genetics and into genomics. Uh, and uh, that's the economy of genetics, right? But also the exposome, which is the, uh, the system that's, that's that determines our life and quality of life, re referring to everything that's not genetic. So we're all built out of our DNA, but the environment we live in, they call that the exposome. Eh? The health of that system is very much, uh, has very much a big impact on our health. Eh? So from one thing, it led to the, to the other. Uh, at the end, it, it learned me that I became a better banker. If I did banking jobs with all this new, newly found knowledge, I became a better banker. I could do things or see things. And I told uh, a talk to Don about this many, many times that brought you to the forefront where banking could or should be going. And taxonomy, it's basically like, uh, you know, the, the, the British Bake Off. You know, if you think you can make an apple pie and your kids love it, doesn't mean it's a good apple pie. Eh? These experts, they have criteria to rate the apple pie and then decide, give you very harsh feedback, if the apple pie is any good, which is really <laughs> insulting, maybe. That's taxonomy. Taxonomy gives, you know, criteria that are for everybody to see, transparent, and to verify with public data or open data how good that apple pie or how good that green investment is actually. That's interesting. For that, of course, you need data. You need external data because if you take the data from the company to validate if the criteria are met, that's not good enough. Eh? You need a lot of external data. And I'll come back to that one later on. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe we should call it the, the EU sustainability criteria. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And oh. it's not just yeah. the EU. Eh? That's just the starters. China and the US will have different taxonomies and we all have to deal with that very soon. I'll come back to that one on as well. Okay. Yeah. Don't forget. Don't forget. Same planet. Eh? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcel. And then, uh, um, so we can uh, deep dive a lot on the, the compliance side of, uh, of sustainability because there's lo lo lots of going on there, but also there's an opportunity side and especially, of course, uh, for, the f for the fintech uh, industry. Uh, so we, uh, we did our best to find uh, 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 an entrepreneur who was really full into, uh, into fintech and uh, your company, uh, Sandra, is, uh, is a, a social fintech company. Uh, focused on sustainability, so happy to uh, to have you uh, have you here. Uh, uh, please uh, please share with us our your personal why. Why did you uh, start uh, on sustainability and uh, developed uh, the social handshake? And uh, please explain so that we have really clear what fintech element is in your proposition and what sustainability element is in your proposition. Yeah. Sh please share your uh, your thoughts on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I think to start with the why, um, originally I come from the charity sector. I used to work at uh, did many projects in India with child labor, um, Indonesia on sustainability, and also worked uh, a lot in Sudan with Free Press Unlimited on independent media. And then I wanted to see the completely other side, so I switched to business and became a strategy consultant. I did that for five years. And what I noticed was very gradually, I just started contributing less and less to a better world. Um, like in the beginning, I was still very much a charity girl, even when I worked in business. Um, and for me, I really had a wake up call. So after four years of working as a strategy consultant, I switched on the TV. I saw all these images from Syria and had a feeling, oh, I want to do something. I want to contribute something. And also realized actually, I'm hardly doing anything anymore to contribute to a better world. And that was really a wake-up call because I, I used to be the charity girl. Um, and I started talking about that with people around me in the business world. And I heard so many times, oh, I have that same feeling. I want to do more. I don't know how. It slips my mind. Life happens. But so many people who actually yeah. want to contribute yeah. more to a better exactly. world. Looking at you, life did happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, that's a different story. <laughs> but a lot, of, a lot of people who actually want to contribute more, so I thought there's a great unmet potential here. So we need to make doing good a whole lot easier uh, and more attractive for people. And that's actually how we started with the social handshake. So the goal of the social handshake is to make doing good easy. We looked at what is available already, what isn't. So there's a lot around volunteering and there wasn't anything around giving through business. And I know that if you give, for example, straight from your salary, you can also give with a lot of tax advantages. It's super easy uh, because it's straight from pay. You don't miss it. So I started looking into that and it turned out this is very common abroad in the uh, US and in, in, uh, in, in the UK. This is very normal and didn't exist yet in the Netherlands. So I thought, hey, let's introduce payroll giving in the Netherlands. And of course, you need fintech for that. So we set up a fintech company. Yeah. And that was about four, four years ago? Yeah, three and a half years ago, we set yeah. up the company. It took us some time also to figure out, OK, how can we make this work? We need an agreement with the Dutch tax authorities. There is a fintech and a platform aspect. So a lot of building before you can have actually, well, do it. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really great. So uh, l uh, let us uh, uh, hear more about what you experience with the companies you're serving. Um, and indeed, uh, you already mentioned it. Um, uh, everybody would say, uh, why, uh, why sustainability? And they're ta they start talking about their children and generations to come, right? So, so thank you for being here. It's <laughs> not, it's not long, right anymore. Yeah, I, c I can't hide it anymore. Can <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good, good that you're you're here. And I think I really it's interesting. So in sustainability, everybody has his own angle. So it's not uh, a one story. Ma it's not that everybody is scared about the dikes. Maybe after uh, Leon's uh, pitch, uh, th they should be and they are. Um, but also, my my angle was different. So. Um, I was working on innovation and, uh, and that's really tough to really uh, invent something that's not there and then put it in the market and scale it. So you need to really solve a problem. If there is not a thorough problem at your starting point and in your discovery and in your, your scaling, your, uh, you will hit wrong. Um, and I just found out gradually that all the problems I tackled uh, upon were sustainability driven. Though Those were the big transitions we were in. And that is also wha where I find my heart. So I thought, hey, this really makes sense now, uh, all the uh, experience I had in my work. Now I can put it to, uh, to the best use and make my, uh, well, make my life valuable, right? For my working life valuable. Um, so that drives me. And I think um, uh, also what we have here uh, 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 in the panel, but also uh, I think in this, uh, in this, uh, this network environment, is not about one uh, party who has to do something alone, um, but it's about everybody uh, uh, chipping in, taking, uh, taking their, uh, their role, taking maybe a, leader, a leadership role because the urgency is so high. So what I would like to do with you uh, to reflect on what you uh, uh, think um, uh, the segment you are really uh, looking into is doing now on sus sustainability and where do you see a gap? Where is, is room for them to improve? And Marcel, like I said in the introduction, you uh, you have seen all the the banks uh, in the uh, on the ugly part where when you when you're looking at the the data quality, so you know them uh, from uh, from uh, within. Uh, what is your view on how banks are um, uh, working on sustainability and where's the gap? Uh, there's a big gap. Uh, we pre-discussed, uh, but it's uh, quite uh, maybe s simple to summarize. What you see that regulation is quickly. Uh, you know, accelerating, uh, becoming more and more intense, where it's uh, giving more and more implications for more and more regions like uh, China and the US. Uh, so only faster and faster, only more and more. So big corporates like ING are facing five minute changes of regulation. So every five minutes, there's a country in the world that thinks of something new where a company like ING has to comply with it in a certain time frame. So you cannot win that race anymore because this climate transition is accelerating this. Uh, this will go to one minute probably instead of the other way around. Take the opposite side. If you look at investments or strategies for asset management, liability management as well, that's not accelerating. That's, I think, slowing down. Uh, this taxonomy is leading many companies to decide, okay, let's forget about green for the next two years because it's so difficult to be this green as the EU, EU is asking us, so let's maybe postpone that for a little bit. Maybe Leon can say something about that later on during drinks, uh, because 
that, that's a mismatch, right? They should both accelerate. First one will accelerate because of how nature works, and ecosystems will change automatically. Eh? There's nothing we can do about it. Regulations follow, so companies' behavior, investment strategies, should follow in the same pace. Currently, that's not the case. In other words, banks should learn and accelerate to learn to benefit from data that's out there and then collaborate with parties that are better at this job at this moment. And there's many, I can tell you. Uh, so it's a learning problem. We're not learning fast enough. And for learning, as we learn in school, you need to collaborate. You need to collaborate with the professor, the teacher, the smarter child, more interesting child. You know, Otherwise, you will never advance. That's the yeah. key problem, I well think. Yeah, I think it's very worse than what you're addressing. So that that Quite. it's slowing down on on, slowing on the down. proof yeah. uh, on the proof points uh, companies are delivering, especially like the, these intermediaries like financial industries. Uh, though they they uh, they have committed to very serious targets. So uh, uh, for instance, I work for Nationale Nederlanden now, and they have committed to net zero 2050. They're breaking it down uh, for shorter short shorter term goals. Uh, but the commitment is really strong. But uh, the only way to get there is to uh, to prove it, like with uh, sustainable propositions exactly. where you help your clients. That seems strategically smart, intelligent to be uh, to d be doing even more than these commitments at this point in time. A guy like me can calculate the very uh, healthy business case to do that. Still, it's a paradigm shift. Uh, the business model should change, and you should use external data to make sure every quarter that you're aligning fast enough to this reality that nature is imposing upon us. Nature is the dominating force here. Right? It's, not, it's not ING, it's not ABN AMRO. They should follow suit given the logic of that system where people are also being laid off eh, in certain countries. Take Pakistan. Almost half of Pakistan was flooded. You know, that's reality. Eh? Yeah. They're asking for money from this damaged fund as they should. And there should be money in that fund. And that should be coming from companies that make commitments. And those commitments should be financially for the next few years already, not 20 years from now. Yeah, ve very sure. And I, and I think when you have all these big commitments long term, um, uh, you have to calculate on those commitments. And I'm curious, uh, uh, Iris, uh, because uh, everybody's looking at how, how to have that uh, science-based as possible or towards uh, towards one uh, one standard so i'm curious uh, what role you see for the for the academic uh, industry for maybe uh, your your university uh, um, uh, to help us on getting like this this data processed for uh, esg can you um, elaborate on that please well i think um Maybe also a step back. So when I, I started my career, I built a startup in energy management systems and we had a clear roadmap for our development. So first uh, give insight, then create awareness and then take action. So first you, you, you measure your energy uh, consumption and give insight into that, see how the world of your energy consumption is, and then you decide on whether to isolate or whether to you know, turn down the heat. Um, I think the same you see in regulation. So the approach of, of for instance, the European Commission with legislation is to first give insight, create awareness, and then take action. And you need data to do this in all of those phases. So uh, for instance, the CSRD, so the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive yeah. is the so first step. Important four letters uh, for us, CSRD. Yeah, it's an again. again an alphabet yeah. too. <laughs> 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 I have another one, the CS triple D, which is, which is then the next step. So, but the CSRD is, is um, um, trying to achieve transparency with coherent data on those three pillars, so the E, the S, and the G. So how are the companies within the scope of this legislation doing in those fields? And not only with their own operations, but also their value chain. So they have to report actually how their upstream and downstream value chain is doing on ESG. Um, so you as a fintech community, you need to think about sustainability as well in your own operation because if a bank is 
um, making use of your services, you need to report on your ESG data for the bank to actually report on this to um, uh, uh, comply with this legislation. So then the next step is the CSDD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. And that's not about disclosure, but it's about strategy. So then companies that fall within this scope need to uh, um, uh, look and assess the actual adverse impacts in their own operations and their either value chain or chain of activities. There's lots of this debate about the scope. Uh, but then you need to, to make a plan. You need to explain your business model and how this relates to climate uh, uh, objectives, for instance. So I think from uh, both a practical um, um, background, because I also advise financial institutions on how to implement uh, legislation and how to address regulatory strategy, it's about those steps. And from going from zero to 10, that's not working. So you need to do it gradually, I think. Exactly. And what you, see, what you see is that there is really a big uh, a regulation wave going uh, yes. over all these, these banks, but also, also uh, insurance companies. So lots of projects how to, to be, be ready, how to start report reporting also on sustainability. But what I also found, and it's m maybe n nice to go to, to Sander about, uh, it, it is not really um, like uh, giving energy because all this regulation and all, all, all risks that are piling up. Um, but, but if you look at all these areas, uh, Leon also shared, um, there, are, there are also uh, lots of opportunities to, well, to create impact or to, uh, to build a business on it. And that's something actually that activates. So having the, the compliance side of sustainability and the, the business opportunity side closely linked, uh, that's what I think is, uh, is, uh, is really uh, giving acceleration. Uh, yeah. you, your product is being used uh, in uh, lots of companies. Maybe you can, uh, can uh, trigger us a little bit how you see companies working uh, on sustainability. Yeah, yeah well, uh, I think there are two things also just to remark upon what you just said. Um, like with uh, insights and reporting, uh, we, we find that's a big asset because we can show companies, look, if you implement payroll giving, it will give you extra points in these and these frameworks. But we cannot just wait for the reporting to come first and then, then, then to take action. I mean, it's, it's just too little time for that. So we need to start taking action and then also look, okay, how does this, like, we all have, we, we can all be clear about, okay, what is contributing to a better world and what isn't, and start taking action, and then look at, okay, so how, how can this in integrate with the, uh, the current reporting? So, for example, uh, we started payroll giving, and now we're becoming a B Corp, and we found out, hey, actually, every company that so wants to become a, a B Corp. Cor Oh, um, B Corporation, is. these are companies which contribute actually to a better world. It's quite a hassle to go all through all the different uh, questions. Yeah. And um, they're, they're really very strict. And if you have like a B Corp mark, it's also easier to hire tech people, for example, uh, because they like to work for B Corps. So it's also, also good from, an, uh, um, from that perspective. Um, but we found out, oh wait, um, if you actually implement payroll giving, you already get extra points. So you don't have to wait for, for the regulations to be there um, to start implementing. And I think we, we all have a gut feeling of what is good and what isn't. And um, yeah, just not wait, just start taking action, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's, it's good news. So we're, we're in, the, in our final, uh, final uh, time. Um, uh, there is a call also to, uh, to these solutions, like the, the, the startup solutions on uh, both climate uh, and, and health, uh, health uh, challenges w uh, we are facing. Um, uh, you, you saw it maybe in the news, uh, Startup Bootcamp, uh, partner, uh, uh, partner of, of, cor of our uh, Holland FinTech network also, they just claimed they're going to launch 100,000 startups uh, in the next years because they say that is what is needed for the solutions. We saw uh, positive news uh, about hires in the, in the tech industry but it was focused on, on the environmental part, uh, the, the, the climate tech part. Uh, um, so I think uh, we could also uh, give a call here together on uh, fintech companies, entrepreneurs, to see the opportunities uh, in sustainability. And maybe as a final question to you all, you can you share uh, a tip uh, of a, 
of a fintech or fintech opportunity uh, area or maybe a company you want to share with the audience uh, uh, to con con conclude with which is inspiring Sandra um, that's that's a, a difficult question um, I guess there are quite a lot of uh, social and also green fintech uh, just collaborate with them because um, there are many which have found solutions and actually we see the tech uh, like a lot of innovative startups and scale-ups are actually in the front runners of implementing these new um, new uh, concepts like payroll giving and because then it's proven then like the larger companies like for example ING or other larger companies will follow so actually it's also a great opportunity to be a front runner also in this whole sustainability transition yeah be inspired be the front runner uh, Mar Marcel uh, yeah a great question I thought about it we, we prepared it I have two uh, tips if I'm, I'm allowed to do that they're both Dutch so apologies for the bias uh, but one of his uh, Roseman Labs, they uh, support multi-party computation using encrypted data to avoid privacy issues, but also confidentiality IP issues. That means that banks could collaborate across the globe to do interesting calculations, in my book, real time, all the time, about climate impact on mortgages, for example, which is highly volatile at the moment, I think. Second is informati, sorry, innovationspotter.nl, they are like KVK or like Deal Room. You probably know them, but try they try to all add all relevant attributes, which is a data term, so you can identify if I see a company, what's happening upstream to that company and downstream to that uh, of that company, uh, thinking about innovation sp specifically. That company does way more than KVK, and this sh should normally help people to identify uh, uh, um, upcoming companies. Uh, because they focus on climate transition. Yeah. So any new company that starts out of the attic will be on their, their radar very quickly and easy to find. That's, That's my two tips. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I think uh, I think if we, we look at the E and, and the S, they're both equally important. And sometimes the focus goes more to climate than I know because of the pressure that we have there. Uh, but also the S is very important. And one of the things that is going to be a focus area is the dialogue with stakeholders, with affected communities, with customers, users, society. And um, as with hospitals, they have client councils that they have to have a dialogue with. You will see that this is going to be mainstream. So a lot of discussions is about having this dialogue and technology can really support and enable this dialogue to get a, a large outreach and uh, exposure on this and to you know to get the input and the feedback um, so I see an opportunity there yeah so so, f so for me uh, to, to conclude with there, there are uh, so so do challenge me uh, to name a sustainability challenge where there's not already eno enough the solution available uh, the last couple of years I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of innovations um, and uh, the challenges are getting higher and higher. So there is there is uh, lots of need uh, for more for more um, uh, innovation power. And uh, luckily, you will see some of those examples later on uh, in the startup uh, pitches on financial inclusion and materials. So <coughs> two two very diverse topics. So for now, I would like to thank uh, the the panelists uh, Iris, Marcel, and uh, Sandra, and uh, Don to you to uh, take it over to the pitches. <laughs> for these uh, abbreviations and uh, the actually pretty complex world of trying to do good, right? I think that's, that's I think also at least my takeaway from uh, from your the, the panel discussion just now, that uh, even though everyone might be inclined to leave the world better than found uh, and also leave no one behind, it's actually quite difficult to do so in, a, in an easy way. Um, but let's see, of course, technology can provide solutions from time to time, and I'm always at least always very enthusiastic to see how entrepreneurs are always putting purpose first and are all trying to make a, a, a proper contribution to, to society. So from that end, uh, I'd like to get our um, questions. Uh, we'll keep the questions for during drinks, right? We're running a bit out of time. Uh, so we'll go to Hank John to uh, hear about Admin uh, and see how you're doing here uh, today. Come forward. Uh, have you got a mic already? Oh, okay. 
So we go to here from admin, here's the clicker. Groene. Groene, okay. Thank you. Bon. Let's Thank give Henk John a big hand, everyone. <coughs> Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, due to time, I'll skip my introduction, but basically I started as an investment banker and I made a switch in 2016 towards FinTech uh, with Menno and Startup Bootcamp, so it all comes together, and uh, sustainability in 2019. So here, when FinTech and sustainability come together, I love to be here. Basically, we are a neobank. What we're doing is leaving no one behind. So thanks for that. Culture meets currency. Why do we say that? Because this is a diaspora perception problem. Basically, the diaspora immigrants, people from a different country who live abroad, they ha are having a lot of problems to have bank accounts to do transactions. And why is that? Because it's being perceived as complex, high risk, and expensive, which is not really true. So that's why usually what you find out there is not user friendly. And that's when admin comes in to solve these problems and make life better because we leave no one behind. A little bit background in data. IFM, Dutch Authority, World Bank, everybody knows the World Bank. Basically what they're stating is that the diaspora on the one hand doesn't feel recognized if they go to a regular bank, not ING, but the other banks. That they don't feel comfortable and they don't find the products and the services they like. But on the other hand, they really want to get engaged with not only the country where they live, but also their home country. I'm from Suriname, so I'm very biased from the Caribbean, but I have experienced that as a child, and my mother, as a matter of fact, has experienced this same thing as we speak. A lot of services in demand, not just remittances, which everybody thinks about, but also loans, investments, and uh, like more creative financing. Okay, we are admin. We went live at the end of the summer last year. Uh, at this point, European and UK nationals can already be on board and they can do all the normal payments that you can also do at ING, especially in the SEPA region, but also international, about 200 countries, no, two, yes, 14 currencies in about 200 countries, but we want more. We have about 12,000 downloads, 7,000 active clients, around 5 million in uh, euro value transactions, so not, not 4 million transactions, but the value. Uh, but the, the big trick is not just that, the big trick is how to get the people on board who are not on board. And we have a few very nice partners to help us with that, TerraPay, Tunes, and BPC. We'll make sure that we can do what the big banks don't want to do, because they can do it. It's not a regulatory issue, it's a risk management issue. And we have the means, uh, the compliance to help mitigate that risk. Okay, what happened to my screen here? That's interesting. Why is this happening? Okay, I think we skipped the slide, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, I'll just do it. Okay, what is the go-to-market? The diaspora, of course, is a global issue, but we, since we have a team of four, from which two are from the Caribbean, one is from India, and one is from Goa, we decided let's put our money where our mouth is, so we're starting with the European corridor, UK, English-speaking Caribbean, and Holland, and the Dutch-speaking Caribbean. And we do that with, you know, the basic uh, proposition at this point in time, remittance, multi-currency accounts, and other services. But of course, we'll expand once we get the funding. And we do that with local banking partners in the Caribbean. One is my former employer, so that makes it easy. Menno, you know, the Hankering Mark is one of my local partners. And we're working also with telco partners like Digicel, who cover the full of the Caribbean. <laughs> So we take Europe, Caribbean, and then we move on from there. Okay, this is a bit about the market size. If you look at the neobanks, somebody mentioned it, neobanks are exploding. Uh, if you look at 2022 and 2028, expected growth tenfold. And if you zoom in on remittance, which is the first big play that we are implementing, only in the, the Caribbean, Latin American region, e extremely uh, strong growth. As a matter of fact, uh, COVID made it stronger plus 26%, and globally remittance growth about plus 5%. Having said that, this is our business model. Very basic to start with, card interchange fees, forex fees, SEPA transfers, and there is the subscription model. 
and coming soon in app purchases, crypto exchange fees, in app advertising, API monetization. You need that because you don't make much money on the left, but you engage with the products on the left, you get people on board, and then you take them to the right, and that's where the money is. Because yes, we love sustainability, but we also have to make money to move forward. Target market and opportunity, it's a global play, but you have to start somewhere. We start with Europe, and you can look at a different scope, but let's, let's keep it simple. About 37 million people at this point in time in Europe are unbanked, which is weird because a lot of them have European passports. My mom is an example. European passport, 40 years she worked here. She has a pension here, but the minute she moved back to the Caribbean, she got kicked out of two Dutch banks, not the ING, but the other two big ones. Uh, so it's a problem. These people are dependable, financial stable people who cannot get a bank account. So that's the big market. The smaller market is the non-EU citizens. Uh, we are aiming to get about 1% of that market, which is about 230,000 customers in two years. We, what are we looking for? This is a typical startup bootcamp pitch. <laughs> that's where I was brainwashed. Uh, we're looking for about 500K to 2 million. That will give us a runway of two years. And you can see the biggest money goes to compliance, which is very important. Because again, the big banks do not want certain clients, not because of a regulatory point of view, but because of a risk and compliance point of view. So we put a lot of money in risk and compliance, and of course in marketing. I think Don mentioned that it's very expensive to get the clients for neo banks. But once you have them, and you if you play it right, you can get a good return on investment. This is our team. Like I said, Marvin, the CEO and founder from Trinidad, Zilia from Goa, Hank John from Suriname, and Bharat from India. I think we have a very strong global team with a lot of different backgrounds, like Bharat is, our, is, is very strong on IT, like Camilla Blanco. I am more a commerce guy, Zilia is more operations, and Marvin is our CEO with the charisma. Okay, this is basically my story, so, you know, let's connect. Thanks, thank John. <coughs> yeah, uh, let's, let's do a couple of questions. I'm not sure, sure if anyone in the room already has one. I'll, I'll warm you up a little bit, uh, because I think it's, it's uh, one of the things that always strikes me is that everyone's talking about neobanks like it is something really special, but of course, it's not, right? It basically, you have the same regulations, you have to, s you have to do the same job as other banks do. So I think it might be interesting to, to just hear your perspective a bit on what do you think actually then you do different than a regular bank uh, in your eyes? Uh, good question. Uh, two things. One, like I said, ING, Rabo, Arben, Amro, they can service these customers, but they don't for two reasons. One, they don't like the risk profile, the risk reward profile. Yep. We don't have that issue. We like the risk reward profile, that is one. And secondly, a lot of these uh, potential customers, they don't feel at home. For, one, for instance, if you're from India or from Indian descent in Suriname and you want to get married, you go to the bank and you get a big loan for your wedding. They don't do that at ING, Rabo, Arben Amro. They don't feel comfortable doing that. So that's a misunderstanding of the customer group, basically. Exactly. Uh, we understand them because that's where we came from, mm -hmm. even though I, I must admit I grew up in the Netherlands. But uh, I worked for a local bank in Suriname for about 12 years, so I got to know my own culture. So I think it's a culture thing, and it's a risk-reward profiling thing. Sure. Yeah, clear. Thanks. Beno? John, yeah, I saw 25% uh, to marketing, and marketing is really expensive for a neobank. Uh, uh, c maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit what do you what are you expecting? Because I'm assuming the target group you're after, uh, you can be much more creative, uh, attracting them. The, sh the sharing part is maybe uh, a little bit stronger there. Yeah, uh, the 25% is too big a number, but why? You don't want to be too conservative, especially when you talk to VCs. The, the, the current approach from the Caribbean is pretty, pretty easy. Like my former employee, the Hawking Bank, they have about 200,000 clients, which is, for the Caribbean, it's a big number. All those 200,000 people have relatives in the Netherlands because of the colonial past. <laughs> they are doing all the marketing for us. Yeah. So the marketing from at this point in time, Suriname, Nederland, Jamaica, the UK, it's almost free. So the 25% is for those areas where we don't have that footprint. 
So you're right. It, it, yeah. it, it should be lower. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions from anyone? I was afraid you were going to ask a question. <laughs> I think the, the, the key uh, cost component in your in, on, on the risk side, compliance side, will be the KYC process, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. And then you say, I have a different risk return uh, than, than, than general banks mm -hmm. do. Right? So if I break that down, then either you accept a lower return or you accept a higher risk or you're more cost efficient in your KYC process. What is the... Uh, uh, say that again. What was number one? You, you accept a lower return. True. You are. Uh, you accept a higher risk. No, because we 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 know the customers better. So what the and risk perception is lower than yeah, it actually is. Yeah, that's a bridge is. to my third question, indeed. Or you have a more cost efficient KYC process yes. than the big banks have. Yes, we we do. And, um, and what's that secret? The, the secret is technology, that's one. I don't know, maybe it's too, too long to get into it, but I'm sure you all read about uh, Bunk, which yeah. is a neobank who's doing it differently and cheaper, and they won the case against yeah. the, the government. We're yeah. doing exactly the same thing. Oh. And the third one is, is the, the product offering. I'll give you one example, if I may. If you, if you live in Holland, and you have uh, uh, overwaard on your house, how do you say overwaard in English? Excess value. Excess value. Yeah. Excess value. Yeah. Yeah and you want to buy a house in Suriname or in Jamaica, you can't because there, is no, there are no controls. But since we have local partners in the Caribbean, you can. So we can offer products that others, other people cannot offer and therefore make more money in a way that others cannot make money. Kay. Clear? Anybody Thanks, else? Bob. I don't see any other questions. The rest okay. is saved for the drinks. It's all okay. <laughs> right, let's do that. Let's give you a big hand. Thank you, Thank Angel. You. Then, Victorien, uh, please come forward. Here you go. Looking forward to uh, hear from you about rosa.io. Yes. Red button, oh the sorry, green button. Green yeah. button, right? Yeah, all right. Hi, everyone. Good luck. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, as a final speaker, I'm, I'm going to try to be as uh, entertaining and, and uh, relevant. I'm going to talk to you about uh, raw material sourcing. Uh, I'm Victorien, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, rosa.io. I'm going to start with a few facts All right, on the, the context. Um, I think you all know it, but the energy transition is on its way. Uh, and with it, the electric vehicle battery market that is going to value 166 billion USD in 2026, while Europe plans to have a third of the global battery production, which is completely huge. This means that to achieve that energy transition and to achieve that shift, we're going to need to mine 40 to 50 times more metals. The tricky reality behind that is that those sourcing and extraction sites comes with a high environmental and social footprint. So I think we, we all agree that, and that's what we said previously, that to reduce, we need to monitor, right? Um, the, the huge issue, while under the pressure from uh, regulators and under the pressure of final consumer, Industries like the battery industry are struggling to actually monitor those impacts. Why? Especially because sourcing sites and mining sites are remote location in like uh, countries and, and sites difficult to, to access. They are most of the time in what we call frontier markets where sometimes corruption can be an issue. So it's very hard to get transparent and reliable data. And as well, the mining companies themselves and, and most of the mining company they actually don't monitor sustainability on site. That's what we try to answer through uh, technology. Uh, and we like to use that thing where you say that uh, a picture worth a thousand words. Uh, we think at Rosa.io that the satellite image is worth a thousand ESG audit. That's why we provide to the industries, like the battery industry, we have software using AI and Earth satellite observation to track, communicate, and reduce these negative impacts. Um, unlike the current um, external and internal audit services that are time consuming, not cost effective, our solution is independent, data driven, and visualization oriented, which is way easier to actually take better decisions. So yeah, a few examples, uh, for example, of, of what we can do through basically indicators 
uh, that we extract from satellite images. So you can see here, for example, um, the actual impact of a mining site in, in Brazil on the, the forest and on the forest cover. So through that technology, we are able to score historical impact. So we can actually um, yeah, say like the, the, the area that has been deforested, but as well to flag almost in real time um, if there is like any deforestation ongoing. Another here study case uh, in Indonesia for um, nickel mining, um, where we are able actually to spot what we uh, call slag, uh, which is a waste from uh, mining uh, and, and nickel mining activity, where we are able through that, what we call the color change index, to actually count the number of occurrence of those events. So we can say like in the past six months, it happens 10 times so that we can actually score, again, the impact on the environment, but as well the impact on the society and, and the communities around as well, because in this example, we don't see it, but also in that type of uh, regions, you get a lot of uh, fishermen villages that are super impacted by those slag events and, and kind of mud uh, events. Of course, uh, from that very focused approach, uh, the, the ambitious uh, uh, and the ambition for us is to become the leader and, and global reference for sustainable raw material sourcing in any industry. We're trying to have really that uh, bottom-up approach where we, we start to build a framework with that industry that is moving super fast. And again, we, we, talk, uh, we talked about the CSRD, uh, but in this industry, you also have what we call the EU battery regulation. Uh, which will focus really on that industry. And I think this industry will um, lead also this kind of, of uh, movements. Uh, so we are making money through a SaaS uh, feature-based model um, to, to provide basically our clients with the best level of services. But we also uh, currently develop what we call the, the open map, uh, where it's basically a map to show students, researchers, anyone, everybody in, in that uh, room some impacts of basically the products we are buying uh, because we also think that obviously the, the end consumer awareness will push the industries toward better practices. And yeah, of course, uh, we started, uh, Rosa, with, with my co-founder and now, now with the team uh, because we wanted to achieve uh, and participate in achieving a more uh, just and people-centered uh, transition. Um, and we basically provide our customers with KPIs that will allow them to take better ESG-related decisions. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's all for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to get your, your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Uh, any questions? Okay, Marcel, we'll start with you. Yeah. Hi. You yep. mentioned sensors for the, the corporates. Can you maybe explain what that means? Sensors? Sensors, using sensors probably yeah. on site. Yeah. Can you maybe explain what that means? Yeah, protection? basically, yeah. So we, mm, we really base our technology first on satellite images, which is what we call remote sensing, uh, because it's coming from the satellites. But we also think that obviously it's not the um, unique and, and it's not enough uh, in terms of data sources. And that obviously you need uh, sensors on site and at the mining level to complete uh, what you can have from the satellite images. So we, we really focus at the moment on satellite images because for us it's really bringing uh, new data uh, and also data in a more cost-effective uh, way uh, because obviously it's easier to scale uh, images uh, uh, that are coming from satellites that to send people on site in every site or deploy drones on every site you have. But definitely the, the right combo will be on-site monitoring from yeah, sensors um, and as well remote sensing from satellite that can be uh, scaled. Bien entendu. Grand merci. Merci. Thanks. Yeah, Neil? Uh, I'm so curious to see if it's the best Holland FinTech bet meetup I ever <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the only one, but <laughs> I think it's... <laughs> Better than all the uh, yeah. the other, and, and, and I, I already love the panel, but the two, I think the two examples, both Edmund and this one, is 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 spot on on uh, what what the challenges are that we're facing. Um, one question on 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 your proposal, uh, Victoria. If if you look at the biggest issues, especially in in, in mining, is on the um, 
social side, it's living wage, child labor, and how can you see that from a, a satellite or from a sensor? So I, th I, my assumption is more the environmental part yeah. that is focused on than on the social part. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> so first, um, I, I would say that we, we always talk about ESG trying to kind of separate the E from the S from the G. Uh, for example, in, in our case and, and on the, the concrete uh, uh, case I talked about about that uh, fisherman village in Indonesia, we most of the time have indicators that will both answer environmental issues and social issues because we human li uh, live in our ecosystems, right? Uh, so for example, when we monitor kind of um, water uh, pollution events, Obviously, it's an environmental indicator uh, because you have um, an impact on, on biodiversity, but obviously as well, it's impacting the fishermen that are along the coast and that are living in that ecosystem and that are living from that ecosystem as well because now they have to uh, go actually fish um, more and more far, right? Uh, so you have that type of stuff that can answer to the E and the E, the S. Uh, obviously, satellite images are um, bringing more data on the environmental side uh, because it, it makes sense. Uh, but definitely, again, for, for us, it's um, the answer will be, again, combining different uh, sources. Uh, so combining from remote, from on-site sensors, but as well from people still going uh, on-site and, and still yeah, asking those, those communities around and having partners on site to um, yeah, know if, if the implementation of those companies are, are going well, how do they feel about uh, the, the impact, and, and uh, what we want to bring as well on the part where um, the guys need to act and to reduce is to bring those local partners, local companies, local communities um, with those downstream players as well because most of the time they are not in contact directly with them. Uh, so I think it's a combination of, of everything. And what we try to answer through satellite images is first a lack of good quality data. Uh, and obviously it's, it's a bit focused on, on environmental uh, issues, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, anyone else still in the room with any questions for Victoria? Yeah, go ahead. Wait, there's a, there's a mic coming. Yeah, sorry. Uh, perhaps an offer for you. <laughs> We've done pretty much the same with satellite images and then sensors on the ground. Uh, the case was not about mining, but about carbon sequestration, mm -hmm. where you can see how much uh, carbon the soil could actually absorb. So it might be interesting for you uh, later on to connect with me to see if there's, because we have the same thing, right? Those are spots in Africa, for example, where you want to see hey, how in a social context are you going to create more value for farmers in order that they can create basically carbon credits later on and then you need those satellites and sensors in order to get a good estimation of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. No, I think the, the trend uh, has been here for a while. The, the thing is that now, and, and why we focus on, on the mining industry as well is because the plan coming from Europe but from the US as well to um, uh, relocate the battery production is quite recent. Mm -hmm. uh, they took that initiative quite recently and with it obviously the new regulations and where basically uh, in the past and, and even still now people that are uh, car manufacturer OEMs that are actually selling EVs are using batteries coming from China. So they were saying okay like I mean we, we're buying the batteries we, we cannot know what's happening at the sourcing level. Now that they produce in Europe and in the US, uh, and that's what we said about the complete monitoring of the value chain, they have to be responsible for the complete value chain. So now they have to dig into what's happening on site. Mm -hmm. And that's why they there is like a huge um, uh, yeah, dynamic on, on that uh, field. Yeah. That would definitely take up on the offer to uh, yeah, for sure. connect. Uh, no, <laughs> 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 Let's connect up there. That, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, also got an interesting idea, actually, but I'll, I'll come back to it later. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, is it yeah, working? I think it's on. Yeah. Um, so I think you're doing a great job. I was wondering whether you actually took into account your own footprint using artificial intelligence and modeling. Did you have a look at the energy usage and how you can reduce that yourself? 
Yeah, so definitely it's, it's part of uh, what we do and, and um, part of uh, our work is impact measurement from our customers, but impact measurements for ourselves uh, as well. Um, so obviously we, we try to see as well what is the impact of, of uh, machine learning that we are using and stuff. Um, I, I have the chance to actually have a big brother that is uh, having a machine learning platform company that is the, um, currently the, the best uh, machine learning platform beating Facebook AI and stuff like that. And also the first to measure and, and do their accountability in, in scope one, two, three, in terms of the, the algorithm they were proposing. So I've also the chance to have direct access to that kind of info. So that's uh, make it easier, but definitely I think that's important as a sustainable um, company to see what impact you have yeah, on the planet, on your customers, but as well uh, internally, what you do to uh, reduce that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Let's. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. One more. The final one. Then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. Oh, then it will be brief. The final one. Um, <laughs> do you have any uh, customers uh, related to uh, audit firms? So basically, maybe to, to update as well on, on the stage uh, where we are. Uh, basically, we are currently at the pilot level. So we are closing our first uh, pilot project this, year, this end of the year. Uh, we also closing a first pre-seed uh, round. Uh, so we, we still need to find some, some people to close the round. So we can talk about that as well. Um, but um, yeah, I forgot the, the question, sorry, talking about that. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a long question now. <laughs> um, uh, audit firms, yeah, audit firms. Okay, audit I got firms, it. Yes. Yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah, definitely. So in, in terms of the customer channels, and especially for that mining industry, which is sometimes hard to get to the final customers, we are getting through uh, those actually sourcing companies, either through uh, the downstream players, so the battery manufacturers, because of obviously the battery manufacturers are buying their raw materials through the mining companies, but as well through the audit and, and consulting company that are obviously proposing their services and, and working, working with that type of, of guys. Uh, so it is definitely a channel for us as well to be a technology provider for uh, auditing companies and consulting companies. Yeah. All right, thanks. Let's give Victor Thank a big hand. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. All right, then uh, we're at point of. Uh, please stay. Uh, let's uh, let's look at the wrap up. We've got a couple of uh, extra events coming up, uh, which I think is quite uh, quite interesting. You'll find them here, uh, and otherwise check them out at hollandfintech.com. Um, our next meetup, of course, is the second Friday of January. Uh, so far, we're actually exploring moving it to a Thursday. So also, if you have feedback on that, please let us know. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, wrap this up. Oh yeah, of course, Amsterdam FinTech Week is coming up in September. So please mark your calendars for 12th to 15th of September. Uh, we're really keen on actually making it a big event again. And of course, ESG is also on the agenda there because we're really, again, looking at both the outside in and inside out approach of what's happening in the FinTech ecosystem. Um, and we'd like to know what you thought about the event. So if you have some time, please take out your phone and scan the QR and tell us what you what you thought about it to just get a bit of feedback and understand. I'm glad you already gave your feedback, Leon. So uh, we've got that checked. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. So thank you for this great show and uh, enjoy your drinks. <laughs>